to the Friday edition of the Clemson Dubcast. Really appreciate y'all tuning in. Maybe something y'all can listen to amid all that traffic into Winston-Salem for the wait for Wait a minute. There's no traffic for those games. Maybe you can listen to it on the interstate on your way to Winston-Salem either today, Friday, or Saturday morning, early afternoon. Pulled up some of the analytics from the podcast earlier this morning. 21,643 downloads from the United States. But hey, man, we're worldwide. We got... Listeners in the United Kingdom, 34 downloads from there. Germany, 23 downloads. Ethiopia, one. Estonia, two downloads. Uh, So, pretty cool. And if, hey, any of y'all over in Italy, the 12 downloads from there, if, if you'd like me to come and do a podcast on location, I can crash at your house. Just let me know, and I will book a plane ticket right now. On the website at Tiger Illustrated right now, Paul Strelo has some really good recruiting info in his Friday Insider Notes. Also, up on the site, yesterday's weekly video review. Actually, two parts this time. We took a deep dive into some of the key themes from the win over Syracuse, some of the X's and O's that Dabo Sweeney and the coaches have been talking about this week on both the offensive and defensive side of the ball. Boy, Xavier Thomas, my goodness, what an incredible player, what an incredible future he has. Uh, Lawrence Taylor-like is is all I have to say. I know those are, that is some lofty praise, but man, this this kid's ceiling is is limitless, and we take a a deeper look into that with some with some insight from uh, Brent Venables, title sponsor of the Clemson Dubcast, Parham Smith and Arch and Hold Law Firm in Greenville. Very happy to have them aboard. Couldn't do it without them. Blake Smith and Brooke Arch and Hold, both Clemson grads, both huge fans. Forte of their firm is medical negligence. They represent patients and their family members in medical negligence actions. They also handle all sorts of other complex personal injury litigation. I can vouch for them. About 10 years ago, a family member had a a pretty serious medical situation with one of the local uh, hospitals, went to Blake Smith, and he very quickly and authoritatively gave us some some great advice, and uh, we, we were very thankful for that. Parham Smith and Arch and Hold offers free consultations. Give them a call, 864-990-4581 or parhamlaw.com. Another proud sponsor of the Dubcast is the Abernathy Boutique Hotel. Smack dab in tailgating territory right on 93 there across from lower lot two. Tell you what, the ESPN folks are in town a lot over the course of the year for various functions and duties and and they crash at the Abernathy and uh, the reviews have been just rave from the ESPN folks including of course Kirk Herbstreet who gave them a prestigious Herbie Award uh, I guess about a month ago that's really really cool stuff given that it really hasn't been that long since they opened their doors really cool spot to go hang out during the week and the evenings Taps Bar and Cafe, a little bit of more of a laid-back alternative to the bigger, louder bars in town. Typical bar amenities, but also higher-end wines and liquors for those who have more discerning tastes. Also flatbreads, pizzas, panini sandwiches. Bar opens at 4 in the afternoon. Great gathering spot for a low-key happy hour. Check them out online at theabernathy.com. Okay, back, I guess month and a half ago when this podcast idea first started taking shape and you're thinking of possible guests, David Hale of ESPN.com was one of the first people I thought of. Just a great guy, a great writer, and man, the, the Clemson beat would be 
a lot less entertaining if he were not around. Twitter would be a lot less entertaining if he were not around. There's a lot of bad stuff out there in the media nowadays. A lot of people doing stuff for the wrong reasons and not being very professional. Dave is is one of the good ones for sure. Does it the right way. Uh, has the best intentions and is a total professional. I think even Dabo Sweeney, who <laughs> as we'll get into three years ago, all y'all know about the whole Clemsoning. Or wait, can I say that? Uh oh. Anyway, um, really cool insight into that whole situation and and some of the behind the scenes interactions between David and Dabo that I think you'll find very interesting and enlightening and even endearing, not just for. David, but for the head coach as well. So let's get to it. This was a lot of fun. David came to Clemson uh, earlier this week from his home in Charlotte to spend a couple of days. And so we did this interview in the lobby of his hotel right after he checked in on Monday. So here we go. Hope you all enjoy. All right. We're here with David Hale of ESPN. Dot com. Is it ESPN or ESPN.com or what? what is it? Dot com, I guess, although right. occasionally they'll put me on the TV, and, and that's bad for ratings, so uh, let's say dot com. First of all, let's just start from the top. How crazy has this been to follow this Clemson quarterback situation <laughs> so far? Yeah, pretty pretty crazy. It's for, I said I mentioned on on Twitter during the game on Saturday that when you think about all the quarterbacks who are on the roster or committed nine months ago, and then to think we were one play away from Hunter Renfro running the <laughs> offense, that is an insane thing. And then like you know, part of me says I don't know how the coaching staff handles this any differently than they have. I mean, they've been. I think as honest and patient and uh, aware of the situation as anybody could be. And then you look at what was, I think, more or less a train wreck at Alabama and Jalen Hurts more or less said so uh, before the season. And yet here we are, Jalen Hurts is still playing and on the Alabama roster and Clemson's in this situation where they might be starting Chase Bryce against Wake Forest. And you say, how in the heck did we get to this point? It's a, it's a very strange thing. And, um, you know, I asked Christian Wilkins about this, that it isn't, it's a weird dynamic because the dynamic of player transfers in general has changed so much. And I mean, he kind of was like, yeah, you know, this is, I asked him, I think, you know, as a player, do you think this is a, a good thing in the long term that, that players have more power in these situations than they probably ever did before? And he's like, yeah, I, th- I think so, but we don't know how any of this is going to happen overall. This is still very new. Kelly Bryant's not going to be the last guy to do something like this. Um, you know, Jeff Scott mentioned that none of them anticipated the red shirt rule playing out this way. So, I mean, we knew it was going to be a drama filled situation because you don't have an incumbent guy who takes you to the playoff and a quarterback, a freshman of the talent level is Trevor Lawrence is that those stars don't align very often, but the way that it's played out has been so far beyond, I think what any of us could have anticipated initially. You know, I go back to the spring uh, when they had all these, this assortment of five and four stars on the roster and, you know, Dabo and his staff do a great job of cultivating that family atmosphere here and it does mean a lot and it is really profound but it's not all kumbaya right i mean right. you got play, players are a lot, yeah. a lot of players are going to look out for themselves in the end and they want to play well, and you know people have called kelly bryant selfish for this decision and I, I suppose that's true in the strictest sense of things that he made a decision that benefited himself more than all the people around him but I mean, at what point is selfishness or self-preservation a, a valuable asset, too? I mean, I don't think you can look at him and say he made the wrong decision. There's certainly, especially for a guy like Kelly, I don't think there's any guarantee he gets a shot at the next level. He has one more year of playing football, a thing he's done his entire life and cares passionately about. I don't know how you say a guy doesn't deserve the right to be selfish in that situation. Now, uh, you know, at the same time, I think, you know, you look at the guy uh, at Oklahoma State who decided, oh, I'm just not getting enough passes thrown my way, I'm, I'm leaving. Yeah, there's a, a, a line there, I think, somewhere between 
uh, being selfish and wanting to put yourself in the best situation that is good and then being immature and saying, I'm not going to work through problems, which is bad. And, you know, again, I don't care how much you try and, and cultivate a certain mindset within your locker room. You got 105 guys in there, 85 of them on scholarship, and most of them under the age of 22. There's a lack of worldview there. And and I don't mean to apply that necessarily to Kelly Bryant, because I don't necessarily think that the decision that he made was wrong. But to assume that every guy in a locker room is going to say, the only thing that matters to me is that we win tomorrow, that's just foolish. It's just not the way it is in any locker room in the country. Did you, in watching the game against Syracuse, I guess you were, you were home, but still watching it yes. on TV, it just still seemed like the events that unfolded in that game affirmed what Dabo and the staff were telling Kelly Bryant when they were trying to get him to stay. And <laughs> right. They, hey, Trevor could play poorly. <laughs> yeah. Trevor could get hurt. I mean, you could argue that had Trevor, Trevor, not, he, he wasn't any great shakes before he got hurt. So he could have struggled. Kelly could have come in, won the job back, and be starting on Saturday at Wake Forest. And, uh, I, you know, I don't know how the conversations necessarily went between Dabo and Kelly Bryant, but I'm certain there was not a, hey, Trevor's going to start now and you aren't going to see the field again unless there's an injury like that. I can't fathom that that, that was the case. And, I mean, Kelly Bryant's skill set, I think, would have been valuable on this offense, even if he was playing 10 reps a game. You know, you put him in a wildcat situation, he's valuable. You split him out wide, he's valuable. You put both those quarterbacks on the field at the same time that might be one play a game but it could be one big play a game uh and as you said let me trevor lawrence for as talented as he is he not ever started a game before you know we don't know what is going to happen with him long term i think long term he'll be fine but when we're talking about a team who is walking a tightrope to the playoff there's no long term about it it is especially in the acc this year where you're not going to have resume wins you can't afford a bad loss and and so, you know, I think that's the short-sighted part of this for, for Kelly Bryant. But there's, again, it's a complex question, and it's a complex question that he had to answer in about 48 hours after finding out what the situation is. So I don't want to lay a bunch of blame at his feet, but, yeah, you're entirely right. I mean, it's – look at the – go back and look at the number of teams who finish a year with only one quarterback having started a football game. I mean, it's probably less than 50% would be my guess. Tell me – I mean, the, the takeaway that I've had after spending some time around these players and coaches, both on Saturday after the game and also – and we're recording this on Monday, by the way. It's going to drop on, on, on Friday morning. I like that you say drop. It's like a yeah, weird single is going to drop. I feel like such a hipster. Don't look <laughs> like one. But, but it was – this was not some transaction that could easily be moved past. Kelly was such a presence on this team. It almost seems like – a grieving process that they've had to get past. Is that what you pick up as well? Yeah, look, there's something to be said for that, most certainly, because you know I think people talk about uh, Trevor Lawrence and his sort of even keel personality as an asset, and I think on the football field, generally that is. But even keel is is not always a good thing. Sometimes you need a guy who is providing the spark, who is providing the energy, who is saying, hey, follow me, who is sort of, uh, you know, when especially on, on this offense where you do have some – quiet guy you know t higgins is not this outgoing guy uh travis Etienne is not this outgoing guy mitch hyde is not this outgoing guy um you know so you say where does the personality of this group come from and uh, for the last you know better part of the last two years it's been from kelly bryan i don't think there's any question about it and you look at the the auburn game last year you look at the texas a&m game this year it's not that kelly played out of his mind it's that he took command of a game on an emotional level, in my opinion. You know, he played well enough to win, and that's, those plays were important. But what he did was in a very difficult situation, he had an entire team believing in him. And that's not an easy thing to do. And I think that, that there's a currency that builds up from that over time. So you can't just expect Trevor Lawrence to walk in and have that. Uh, and moreover, I think it's a thing that, that comes with personality. And, I, and we've yet to see maybe what Trevor Lawrence's personality on the big stage is going to be. Um, we know he has talent. 
and we'll see how the personality goes. Deshaun was not a big outgoing guy, but he was surrounded by bigger personalities too, I think. Whereas, you know, Kelly had been, I think, the life of what this offense was. He was the personality of the offense. And so there's a change that comes with that, no matter, no matter how good the guy that's stepping in in his place is. It's hard to sort of separate the quarterback situation with the rest of the team. But, I mean, let's face it, at A&M, the defense played shockingly poorly hmm. uh, late in that game. They had some lapses on Saturday against Syracuse on defense. I got to say, and I'm, I'm assuming you agree that, you know, with me, that going into the season, if you would have told me that five games in, they would have two just white-knuckle games that they were really fortunate mm-hmm. to win, I would have been surprised. What do you make of the season beyond – the quarterback drama, and I know it's hard to separate those again, but but what's your take on how it's gone? First of all, I think there were some obvious, I wouldn't say a red flag, but questions about the secondary coming into the season. And it certainly didn't help Clemson any that three of the first four teams they were playing were option-oriented teams that weren't going to really test you in the secondary the way that Texas A&M or Syracuse were able to. So some of that was, I think, just open questions that they needed game reps to figure out and weren't getting with the competition that they had. Um, Some of it, and I thought this was, you know, I I don't chalk up Christian Wilkins and Cleveland Farrell and and Dexter Lawrence as these guys who were phoning in this season. But, I mean, just look at the long history of the players and the teams or the position units where we have spent an off season talking about, Oh man, five, five first rounders. And aren't these guys going to be great? And this is historic. And, you know, I I think back to Jadavian Clowney a few years ago at South Carolina, like it's impossible to live up to that. It's impossible to ignore it when it's going on. Uh, And it's very easy to sort of be frustrated when that historic level of success isn't immediately happening. And so there's part of me that wondered, you know, how as this early season was progressing, how much of it was just like, well, you know, we don't really need to put our foot on the gas yet, or we're not, you know, or, you know, this isn't quite working out as we had expected, and there's some level of frustration. And so I don't in any way suggest that, uh, Dabo Sweeney or anybody else on that coaching staff or the team should be glad that Trevor Lawrence got hurt and that that game played out as it did. But I also thought that, that Saturday's game against Syracuse was an opportunity for everybody else on that team to say, wait, we need to do our part too. And we can't just sit back and, and expect to be good. And we can't wait for the right time or all the chips to fall into place for all of this to become a great team. And And so I thought you saw a different level of 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 energy, of engagement, of performance in the second half from everything surrounding the quarterbacks that I had not seen. You know, Travis Etienne and that offensive line took over that game in the second half. And the way that the the, the Clemson D-line got after it in the second half, I mean, they made Eric Dungy, who is one of the hardest quarterbacks to bring down, uh, they made him uncomfortable snap after snap after snap. And so to me, I thought... We learned more about Clemson, the team, Saturday than we had in the first four games combined. All right, let's talk about you. Oh, no. Went to Syracuse. (laughs) I did. Studied economics. Well, so I went to Delaware and studied economics as an undergrad. And then I spent uh, three years or so working in accounting and finance and sitting in a cubicle and... uh, just counting down the minutes until I could leave and go home. Uh, and I hated it. And so I said, well, it's, it's time to go do something that you don't hate. And so then I went back to see, I went to grad school at Syracuse and got a journalism degree from there, uh, for a job that I don't hate as much and don't have to be in a cubicle. (laughs) So you decided before you went to grad school, I want to write, or did you not know yet what, what exactly you wanted to do in journalism? Oh, no, I want, well, first of all, I, would not have ever been good on TV. That would have been a (laughs) terrible, terrible situation. No, I always, I, I mean, I really, you know, even in undergrad, I I kind of knew this is what I wanted to do. I loved writing and I loved sports. So, I mean, it made sense, but you know, back in, in the days when I was in high school, I grew up in Delaware, which is, you know, we were suburb Philly suburbanites essentially. Um, 
you know, this was pre-internet days when anybody who wanted to could have a blog. And the idea of, like, writing about sports for a newspaper, even, like, my hometown newspaper, which was not this big gargantuan New York Times type of thing, that idea seemed insane to me. I didn't think that was even an approachable career. So... You know, I kind of blew it off when I got to college, and I thought, well, economics, I'm good at that, too. I'm good with numbers. I can I can make a career out of this. That is something I can do. Uh, and it was only after I went and did a real job for a little while that I realized how much I don't want to do a real job. And so, um, you know, by that time, things had started to change a little bit, and it became a little bit, you know, more of a realistic situation for me. You have built your Twitter presence largely around being good with numbers, and statistics and things like that. I'm guessing that the economics background has really been instrumental in in, in, in part of your journalism. Yeah. Career. So, I mean, I grew up a huge baseball fan. Um, you know, that was sort of my first love. And baseball, of course, makes itself very open to statistics. You know, it's that is the most measured sport that there is. Uh, and certainly when you get into more advanced ways of thinking about numbers, baseball was much more open to that at an earlier stage, too. So, you know, I, I kind of when the Internet first started kind of coming about and, and you could read more and have more voices of people who were into analytics like I I read anything Bill James wrote and Rob Nyer and um, Joe Posnanski and people like that who really were were the writers who embraced numbers from an early point. And at that, you know, I had gone through economics. I understood sort of how that stuff works too. And so the two things just made sense to me that they went together. W- what I hadn't really figured out was how to do it with football because, you know, again, I grew up in the Northeast where, you know, college football is certainly not the biggest thing in the world. Um, so I had to kind of learn the ins and outs of college football after I started covering it anyway. And then there was just precious few resources for it. You know, there was not a lot of outlets that you could even find the data, let alone do anything with it. So it was sort of just, I think, a thing that I I enjoyed because I had done it with baseball and then pretty quickly realized there was a vacancy in the marketplace for it. Um, and it's just sort of grown from there. And I appreciate that there's folks who really... Um, like that side of it too, because I think it's a good, you know, coaches can lie. Coaches lie all the time. Players lie all the time. And sometimes they're not even lying on purpose. They just don't really know. <laughs> the, the numbers can certainly lie. They're, they can, they don't lie, but they can deceive you. But I think if you understand the numbers and you understand how to put stuff together, you can find a lot more interesting stuff there than, and go a lot deeper than you do just by sticking a recorder in front of a coach and saying, hey, what do you think about this? Where did what was your first newspaper job? Uh, I worked at the Albany Herald, and well, so I interned at a few places before that. I interned at the paper in Syracuse, and one in D.C. doing news. But my first one where somebody decided stupidly to pay me for it was in Albany, Georgia, which is this little town in Southwest Georgia. Uh, it was. Um, I will say I would never go back there, but this is sort of the <laughs> this is sort of the way that that you have to be, especially when you're starting out in this business. It's hey, who will hire me? Uh, and they were willing to let me go up and and cover Georgia football a few days a week during college football season, and that seemed like a pretty darn good opportunity for me. I did not understand the geography of Georgia at the time. It turned out that was a three and a half <laughs> hour a drive each way. direction. Uh, I did not understand really anything about what it was like living in the South then. Uh, so that was an eye opener. But it's funny too, because I still have uh, a lot of very close friends that I met from that job. One of the funny things about working in a small town is like the, the handful of people that like you meet and hang out with there, like you really learn a lot about those people because you got nothing else going on. So that was my first job. And uh, I did that for a couple of years, got out and was teaching for, I taught journalism for a couple of years. And then uh, my boss who hired me in Albany, uh, Daniel Shirley, he was the uh, sports editor at the Macon paper, and he stupidly hired me a second time to come back and actually cover Georgia like a real sports writer. And so I did that for the the Macon and Columbus newspapers for a few years, and that was really, uh, that was sort of the turning point of like actually doing real sports journalism. 
So you stopped sports writing when you were in Albany and, and taught at where? <laughs> so um, I was making so little working at the newspaper there. And there was a community college in Albany uh, at the time that was looking for somebody to teach journalism classes. And because I had a master's in journalism, which is something very few people do because it's stupid to get a master's in it if you have an undergrad degree in it, uh, I was one of the few people who was qualified and lucky for them, I was already in the city. And so you didn't have to convince someone to move to Albany and they offered me uh, like 12 grand more a year, which essentially like, I mean, that was close to doubling my salary at the time (laughs) probably. So uh, I was like, well, you know, I can do, I can still do some freelance stuff and write, but I, you know, I can make some money here doing this and it's better. So I'll do that. Uh, and then, um, as every good story is, uh, it comes down to a story about chasing a girl. So I had, uh, met a girl there who was, uh, teaching also at the community college, but she was going to go for her, uh, PhD at university in Kentucky. She had already accepted her admission there. And, uh, so we were dating for about six months when it was time for her to leave. And I said, well, am I going to go there too? Or am I going to stay in this town that I don't like living in? Uh, so I picked up with no job and moved to Kentucky. I ended up teaching journalism at Eastern Kentucky while I was up there. Uh, and that girl decided she did not like PhD school, but she did like me. So we're married now. And, uh, that decision worked itself out well for me, but I will say the one thing, you know, as I, and I did like teaching, I thought it was really good for understanding of journalism in my career. Like, you know, you know how it is when you first get into journalism and you're writing and you're on deadline and like, it's just like, keep your head above water and, and teaching it for a little while allowed me to sort of step back and say like, wait a minute, why do I do things this way? Or why does the story get put together this way? I think it beca- I became a much better writer and reporter having done that. But it was always sort of in the back of my head, like, man, you didn't give this a good enough chance. Like, you got to do mm. that. You got you to put in more time and, and really see where, you know, writing can take you. And, and again, I'm very thankful to Daniel Shirley, who's at The Athletic now, uh, for giving me not just my first chance, but my second and certainly much bigger chance, too. So from Western Kentucky to Athens. Athens. Yeah. Eastern Kentucky to I'm Athens. Sorry, Eastern yeah. Kentucky. Uh, to Athens. And then I was in Athens for a couple of years. And then I got a job. Uh, covering the Phillies uh, in Major League Baseball at, at the hometown paper that I grew up in, in Delaware. And uh, I thought, well, I'll take this job just to prove to all my high school teachers who said I'd never amount to anything that I amounted to something. Uh, and so I did that for a couple of years. And then uh, my lovely wife said, um, covering Major League Baseball is terrible for our relationship. Oh, <laughs> and I agreed with her. And so I uh, got a job offer with ESPN. I was in Tallahassee for a couple of years. We had sort of the uh, initial idea was we were going to cover a bunch of the bigger programs. We were going to have a guy on site there at all of the bigger programs. And they hired me. And I think about three months later decided that wasn't the best of plans anymore. But I did get to spend two years in Tallahassee. I got to cover the 2013 national championship team and all of the extracurriculars that unfortunately came along with that. Uh, And by the time that that 2013 season was over, I was kind of scratching at the walls to get out of Tallahassee. And so um, ESPN was kind enough to allow me to do that, which is good because, um, yeah, I don't think I'd want to be in Tallahassee. I I enjoy a good trip back to Tallahassee every now and again, but living there was not my cup of tea either. I remember Clemson fans as recently as the 2014 season when FSU went back to the playoff. I guess they had won like 27 straight yeah. ACC games, somewhere around there. Anyway, they went undefeated that year. They are really lucky in a lot of those games <laughs> yeah. until they got drilled by Oregon. But as recently as that season, just four years ago, the dominant sort of feeling from the Clemson side of things was how in the world are, are we going to make up ground against this Florida State colossus? What do you make of the disintegration of, of that of that? powerhouse yeah. under Jimbo Fisher. You know, it's an interesting conversation and, and probably one that we could spend hours dealing with. But the thing that I kind of come back to um, 
is Clemson to me, and I don't know how many of your listeners this will mean anything to, but as again, as a baseball fan, reminds me so much of those like 1990s into the 2000s Braves teams, you know, because, you know, Bobby Cox was always a player's manager. And what he did is he gave ownership of the team. You know, he always set the direction, but the ownership was, was, was the teams. It was the players. And there was a culture that was created in the early years when you had Glavin and Maddox, and that was passed along to Chipper and Javi and passed along again and again. And so it didn't even, you didn't need those same guys that were there at the beginning to still be there at the end to have that same culture. It was just an inherited thing. And I feel like that's a lot of what Dabo has, has worked to create and what has allowed the level of success that they've had for now. With, with Florida State, I think there was a, a lot of that was created early on with some of their early signing classes. I mean, I remember guys like Talvin Smith and LaMarcus Joyner and, and Timmy Jernigan and some of those guys who were immensely talented but also really good leaders and really understood what it took to be successful at the highest levels because they had suffered through some pretty ignominious defeats too. And so there was, there was a taste of both sides of it. And they, you know, for all the credit that Jameis Winston got for getting Florida State to that next level in 2013, and I think deservedly so, I'm not sure they could have gotten there without him. I also don't think he could have won it without the, the personalities that were on – all around in that in that locker room from the older guys, um, and then when they moved on after that season, the culture moved on with them, in my opinion. And and part of that again is is Jimbo Fisher has always been the micromanager type, the Nick Saban type, and that can work too. I don't want to say that it can't, but your players have less ownership when the coach is a micromanager, and so I think things. It was a little bit of there just was never the same fundamental leadership culture again after that. I think sometimes when you have a ton of really big talent guys, it's very easy, again, as we talked about, for the for the selfish side of that equation to, to become too big. And then I think there was some, particularly the last couple of seasons, I think there was some legitimate frustration from Jimbo's side where he's seeing Clemson make these huge steps forward and have effectively a, an open blank check to do whatever they wanted to do to make their program great. And Florida State was not giving Jimbo that same blank check. It was a pretty big check he was getting, but not the blank one. And I think there was frustration on his part, and his mind started wandering a little bit. And the fact of the matter is, uh, and I, I truly believe, if, if you ask, if anybody were to ask me, what's what's the best advice you could give about anything that you're doing? It doesn't matter what the thing is. You got to be in with both feet, man. You cannot do anything at a really high level if one eye is sort of looking out the door. And I just think that's sort of what it was at Florida State. And and they were good enough, talented enough for a long time that that didn't matter. You could still win 10 games a year doing that. But when it got bad, it got bad real quick. And that, and that's how little it takes when your competition is Clemson. You know, it's there's not a lot of margin for error anymore. Okay, so you moved from Tallahassee to Charlotte when? 2014. Okay, so and you made lots of trips to, to Clemson uh, dur- during that stretch. How has your well, – I guess when did you first start developing a relationship with Dabo and how has that evolved? <laughs> I'd like to think we had an okay relationship, but uh, if you want to know the moment that me and Dabo really clicked, I guess, or at least had a legitimate, like, all right, we know who each other are now, <laughs> it is, the, of course, the infamous Clemsoning question, which uh, I, I, to this day, will tell you that I think was a very fair question, and w- within the context of how I was asking it, made a lot of sense. He did not care. Uh, he was upset about a million other references to Clemsoning that had happened earlier. Uh, and, you know, it's one of those things I remember when it happened, you know, I asked the question, which I thought that, you know, people don't know this, but like I had talked to players about this beforehand. I had a, a long conversation with Brent Venables about it. Like people saying like, yes, people saying that word all the time is great motivation for us. It's kept us focused. And, and if people might also forget, it was the Georgia tech game after the Notre Dame game. So Notre Dame was this huge win for them I mean, in a lot of ways, a program defining win for them. And then the next week here comes Georgia tech, a team that they were supposed to beat and they curb stomped them. And I said that, that is the mark of a team that's ready to go to the next level, not just getting up for the big games, but getting up for all of them. And so I thought, well, you know, of course, no team has had to have that questioned about them more than Clemson. So I'll ask this question. So Dabo was less than thrilled about it. And I remember when he started, you know, starts in on his rant. 
you know, maybe about a minute, 90 seconds into it, it really just dawned on me like, wow, this is happening. Like, this is a thing that like people are going to talk about and they'll show highlights of it. And like all of us, if we've been, if you followed sports, like everybody's got their favorite coach just went off on a, on a, and I was like, I can't believe I'm in the middle of one of these things. So as unfair as that term has been in the way it's been applied to, to Clemson, the whole Clemsoning thing and losing games, you're not supposed to, how does this team kind of approach that differently in, in your mind? Is it a matter of, like you said, that, that you're focused one game at a time or is it a matter that they don't even think about it anymore? Well, I think it's ridiculous that you're even asking me that question. I I that you even say the word. I mean, I'm serious. I'm sick of it. I don't even know why we even bring up the dead gum word. How about some of these other teams out there that lose – to unranked opponents all the time. That's our 33rd win versus unranked opponent. We ain't lost to anybody unranked since 2011, but I have to come to a press conference in 2015 and get asked that. And that's all media bull crap. I can tell you how they feel about it. They don't like it. It's a lack of respect. It's not doing your homework and paying attention to what reality is. Should not be asked that question. Period. That's how we feel about it. This football team right here has earned the respect. Ain't nobody giving us anything. Not one ounce of anything. They've earned everything they got. And when I have to turn on the TV and people bring up that word and they try to casually throw the word out there like you do, but it's still the word. It shouldn't even be in the conversation. That's how they feel about it. That's how I feel about it. I apologize. I was not trying to be offensive and saying Well, same thing today. Rhetoric on TV today. Same old bull crap. People need to get some more adjectives. This football team has shown up. What else they got to do? We've beaten Ohio State, Notre Dame, LSU, Oklahoma, Georgia, Auburn. We've beaten 33 unranked opponents in a row. We're 7-3 versus top 10 teams. People need to quit talking about that. It's like people are trying to push their own agenda out there. And I'm, I can't believe I got to come into here with a 5 0 football team that just had a great win and have to be talked about Clemsoning. I shouldn't even, shouldn't even be in the conversation. I, I appreciate what you're saying. I, my, my point was simply that this is a team that clearly rebounds quite well, even after a high. I, my, my... If we lose this week, it ain't because of Clemsoning. No, obviously. It's because we just got beat. We're human. We're not, we're, we're just human. Good God Almighty, man. Look all over the country. You got all kind of teams out there getting beat. I mean, we're just a good, we're a football team that has earned everything they've got. And, and again, to answer your question, it, it, they don't like that. It's a lack of respect for what these guys have done. This program doesn't take a backseat to anybody. We're not better than anybody. We, we can lose Boston College. That's the biggest game of the year. We're, they're dang capable of beating us. Had a great chance to beat us last year. We were fortunate as heck to win that game. But we won it. And if they beat us, it ain't because we had some bad whatever. It's because they just beat us. That's football. It's like everybody's sitting around waiting on us to lose a game so they can say, oh, well, there you go again. No, that's bull crap. Next question. But here's what happened afterwards that, that most people don't know. So I, you know, I went out and to talk to Dabo afterwards because I didn't want him assuming that I was being as idiotic as all the other people who threw around the word me meaninglessly. And, and thankfully for me, Tim Beret, the wonderful Tim Beret, came out and mediated as well. And you know, Dabo explained his side of things to me, which was completely reasonable. And as you and I have talked about since then, I think Dabo, that was a thing that Dabo was waiting. Somebody was going to throw him that softball and he was going to knock it out of the park, which he did. And I think it was good for him. He did the right thing. Uh, he also called my editor the next day and said, I hope that you don't think that David did anything wrong here. I should not have reacted that way. He's a fine journalist, and he asked a perfectly reasonable question. Not that my editor was upset with me anyway, but it was a really nice gesture on his part. Um, and I think... You know, it's sometimes it's like any relationship. Sometimes you got to kind of hit a little bit of a rock bottom type of thing. And but but I think I learned a lot about who Dabo was as a person there. I think he learned a lot about who I was. And this is sort of the problem in in journalism in this day and age is that um, we don't get to know each other very well. You know, there's a wall between us almost all the time. And I think having an opportunity like that that 
you know, takes me out of the crowd of people asking stupid questions and me and Dabo just get to have a conversation man to man. It makes a much big, big, much bigger difference in how you interact with each other down the road. And we've had a really good relationship ever since then. And just to be clear, his issue was turning on the TV and seeing the talking heads relentlessly (laughs) talking about the Clemson thing. That's not you. You're a writer. You're, you're boots on the ground. And, it uh, was that what he conveyed yeah, to you? Yeah, and that's, I mean, he even said, you know, I, I'm watching a, a television program that may or may not air on a network <laughs> that I have some tie to, and I'm watching that this morning, and they're talking about it, and and I'm mad about it. He was mad about it before that game kicked off. So, you know, I he I, <laughs> to this day, I guarantee you, he could not tell you the question that I asked. He heard one word, and that is all that he needed to hear. And, uh, you know, again, I, I think, and... The immediate after the math of that sucked, to be quite honest with you. I mean, I was just, I hadn't been covering Clemson long enough for fans to know who I was or what I was about for the most part. So I was just inundated with everything from just another moron working at ESPN to like legitimate go kill yourself death threats. Um, and, and that sucked. But, um, you know, he, he needed to say it too. You know, it's something he, he wasn't wrong for wanting to, for, for saying what he said. I mean, I don't think I deserved it, but it had to be said. And I think it was an important, in some ways, an important stepping, just as much as the actual performance in that game was to say, we're done with this talk, to actually say it afterwards the way that he did, I think was an important step too. And I, I certainly take zero credit for that. But, um, you know, looking back, it's, it's funny how much I think, you know, that speech from him really did everyone after that took a step back and said, yeah, this isn't funny anymore. We're not going to say it. Hey, he gave me a chapter in, a, in the book that I wrote about that <laughs> season. So thank you, David. Um, and I think a week later, I think they played Boston College, and he actually brought it up in a tongue-in-cheek way as basically a way, and he said, no, nah, me, and, me and David are good. He's a good guy, blah, 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 blah. What will it take for the national media to give this Clemson football team the respect that it seems like it's earned? Uh, I don't know. Uh, we just hopefully, we, I guess we got to, we'll just win them all. Uh, but I think, you know, I think we're getting some respect after my man, you know, hammered me with a question last, last week. Uh, he's awful quiet today. Uh, uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, no, he's, uh, Dave and I are good. We're on good terms, by the way. Uh, he was, he was, we were a little misunderstanding there, but, uh, you know, I don't know. I, it's, it, I, you get what you earn. And, uh, and that, I mean, that's another thing, too, that I, I really can't credit him enough because, again, calling my editor is one thing. My editor wasn't mad at me. My editor knows I know how to do my job. But there were a lot of people who were mad at me, and there were a lot of people in that, in that room of supposed journalists who thought I was being unprofessional. Uh, and the fact that he would say publicly that I wasn't wrong and that me and him were, were pals again, and, you know, he didn't need to do that. And, and the way that he did it, was so informal that it didn't feel forced at all, that it wasn't sort of this requisite, like, let me make up for this thing that I said. It was, I mean, I think he couldn't have possibly handled it any better. And again, I, you know, I am, I am never going to be one who said, who climbs on a soapbox to uh, talk about how great or how terrible a coach or an athlete is, because at the end of the day, none of us really know them. And I, I've been burned enough times. And again, I went through the James Winston thing in 2013. I, I know what anyone is capable of, and we don't know them well enough. But I will say, having gone through that experience, I feel fairly confident in saying that uh, it's not a big show with Dabo. I think he genuinely sees a bigger picture to uh, the humanity of what all of us do. And he has his motivations and his goals and his priorities too. Um, but at the end of the day, I think he appreciates that we're all people just trying to get along and and I certainly appreciated the way he handled that. Business owners, you need to know about Tandem Payment, credit card processing company headquartered in Greenville, South Carolina. Office is located throughout the southeast. One of the owners is a 2005 Clemson grad. He's forced the other owner to become a huge Clemson fan as well. Business owners out there listening, you know how painful it is to get the weekly phone calls from the national processing companies promising, quote, the lowest rates in the industry. Tandem approaches this business completely different. They handle all their business face-to-face. Why would you trust the majority of your hard-earned money to somebody over the phone? 
Tandem utilizes a consultative approach where they look out for the best interest of their potential clients. First company across the country to receive the BBB Award for Integrity. Tandem also employs Clemson graduates as well as former Clemson football player Hot Rod McDowell. The newest program Tandem offers is called Cash Discount. You can eliminate up to 100% of your annual credit card processing fees. The best part, it encourages more cash transactions inside your business, plus you save the typical processing fees you pay annually. Call Tandem, 864-672-1570 or tandempayment.com. There's this perception out there that a lot of people have of the media that we like creating such a sensation and we like being in the mix like that. But it's really a nightmare for most of us when that happens. Uh, I mean, did you lose sleep? What was that like for, uh, and how long did it last? Um, I still have people bring it up. I mean, there's still people like, oh, you're the Clemsoning guy, you know, and it's uh, when I, when I finally hang up my uh, recorder and notepad, that'll, that'll be on my, uh, my resume. I'm sure. Um, You know, it's funny. My, my wife went, my wife's from Alabama and uh, she went home for Thanksgiving a few years ago. And all of my nephews were watching the clip on YouTube, laughing about how I was getting yelled at by the Clemson coach. Um, so it's, you know, it still comes up. It's, uh, you know, I never, I, I will always say, and I tell people this about that situation in particular, and, and a lot of situations that become very emotional like that, if you didn't provoke it, uh, it can be a good thing because you're getting a very emotional, honest response. I mean, that's all I want out of somebody is to, is to be honest, you know, and that was, you know, there was a very uh, surface level cut for Dabo and I kind of just barely nicked the scab off and then you really saw what was underneath. Um, so I think there's value in that. What's happened in our profession, which is unfortunate is that way too many people aren't interested in the value of it, the emotion, the honesty of it. They're interested in how many times that clip can get replayed again and again and again, how it becomes the sound bite. I mean, it's sort of like, I remember the, the Jim Rome, Jim Everett, Chris Everett thing, and it was such this huge big deal. We get something like that, it feels like, every day anymore. And, and so there's no uh, desire to try and get something real. It's a desire to get something outlandish. And, and that to me is, is, is a joke. That's not what we're in this business for. You don't have to answer this if you don't want to, cause it was a private conversation, but you said you, you followed him out, uh, outside the press conference that day, just to make sure you could smooth things over. Was he still upset to begin with? Did you have to, um, Ye- I, he was annoyed, I would say yeah. more than upset. And, and again, like he and I knew each other, but didn't know each other. Well, I was just a guy who showed up every now and again. Um, and I worked for the same company he was already upset with. Um, so, you know, yeah, he was still upset. Um, but not like yelling at me or anything like that. And, and again, I, it helped that, that Tim Prey was there because Tim could kind of mediate and say like, no, Hale's an okay guy. It's, <laughs> it'll be all right. So, what? I, one of the things I think that is n- most impressive about you is that on, twi- <laughs> on, on Twitter, people like you. Clemson fans like you, even after <sighs> even after that whole uh, dust up. You 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 disagree? It's, uh, yeah, no, some do. I would think <laughs> some do. I, I mean, it doesn't seem like people are going after you. It seems like you you are a part of the Clemson conversation, and you're not. Um, you're not. It doesn't seem like you're rallying Clemson fans up a lot. Maybe that's a reflection of them winning, I don't know, 48 of the last 54 games. But it just seems like you have done a really good job of um, of participating in the conversation and, and, and just, you know, being relatable, I guess, if that makes any sense. Uh, I mean, that's genuinely what I'm trying to do. And, I, I, you know, some people aren't going to like me because I will say something that they don't like, you know. I, you can't help that. I mean, Twitter is what it is. Social media in general is what it is. But I also think it's such a valuable resource in, in having a conversation. You know, I learn a lot from my interactions with fans on Twitter. You know, I learn like what their concerns are. I, you know, I get to be part of the conversation because I kind of learn some of the inside jokes. You know, I mean, that, that stuff matters to me. And I so you know, the way I try to approach Twitter um, is... 
uh, a to to have something to offer. You know, I want to be I want to be valuable because there's no reason for you to follow me if all I'm doing is just offering some half-assed opinion about things. I want to I want to show that I know what I'm talking about, and so that I think by doing that affords me a certain level of um, begrudging acceptance, even if I say something bad about your team. Uh, and then it's just to be a guy, man, I'm a sports fan, just like the rest of you, you know, I'm hopefully doing this job professionally and objectively, but I get where you're coming from because I've, you know, (laughs) we're sitting here recording this as the Cubs and Brewers are playing in a game that, you know, the Cubs, (laughs) I grew up loving the Cubs and I know all of the, the highs and lows of what goes along with that. So I can appreciate what it is to be a fan too. Um, and so, you know, I, I think, you know, again, this is sort of like where I was saying with the, the relationship with Dabo is that th- there's a little bit of a wall that has been created on our end between us and, and our readers and our fans, too. And I think that's a bad thing. I mean, it, it has to exist to some extent, but the more you can show them, like, I'm just a, just a human being, same as you, you know, and I'm trying to do my job the best I can and I'm wrong sometimes and I'm right sometimes, uh, but nothing I'm doing is out here to try and upset you. It's not, I'm not, I'm not trying to be a jerk and I'm not trying to get a rise out of you. I, I always laugh every time somebody says my tweets are clickbait about something. I'm like, there's <laughs> nothing to click on here. It's just a tweet. Um, it is. It, you learn a lot about human psychology from Twitter, too, I will say. Like, the amount that people are able to read into, like, you know, 180 characters. <laughs> and it's like, I didn't say that. I don't know where you're getting this from, but okay. And it's, So, you know, it is it is a mixed bag. But I, I will say, for me, and I might be unique in this situation, but for me, Twitter has been a net positive. There are certainly my bad interactions and days where I say, i got to get off this for a while, or I'm... I'm going to see what's at the bottom of a bottle of whiskey to keep myself <laughs> sane. Uh, but more days than not, I have good interactions, I think. My favorite is when I make an observation about a football team that is not Clemson. <laughs> you get inundated with, why are you reporting on them? You're supposed <laughs> to be reporting on Clemson. I'm like, I, can I watch football? Is that okay? <laughs> I, I, I like college football. Is that okay? Uh, yeah, people are really high strung about it's that. Am- so I I, uh, I have been writing this season our ESPN Saturday Night Rap column that is sort of like just what happened on Saturday. What does it mean for the football landscape or whatever? And so the lead that I wrote uh, this Saturday was about the effect- effectively season saving drives, ninety four yards and ninety six yards by Ohio State and Clemson, and both of those drives occurred. Both of them in really dire situations, both of them really impressive drives. Uh, and the amount of anger from Ohio state fans that I dared compl- compare their drive to Clemson's Seriously? drive. They were so <laughs> angry. And I'm like, first of all, I didn't even compare them to say like one was better than the other. Or they were the same. I just said <laughs> that they both occurred and were impressive and Oh my Lord, they were angry about it. And it's just like the, the zero sum game aspect of like, uh, if you say something nice about one team, that just means you hate every other team. <laughs> that is one of my favorite parts of Twitter. How many hours a day do you spend on Twitter? Uh, it depends. If I'm supposed to be writing a story and transcribing, I might spend 24 <laughs> hours a day on Twitter because I will do anything <laughs> to put off transcribing an interview. Um you know, it's one of those things I'll usually just go on and kind of check and see oh, what's new, what's going on. Um, you know, on a Saturday, I've got TweetDeck open all day and I'm kind of keeping tabs on what people are talking about. Um, sometimes I'm just, you know, bored and need something to entertain me. And it's nice because there's always a few thousand folks waiting to have a conversation about something. D- okay, I find that when I'm at a game, I have to shut the computer yeah. and, and folk because uh, of all these windows and tweet decks and all that it just I find myself you know if I'm involved in all that then I the game ends and I feel like I don't really have a good grasp of what just what I was paid to you're watch. half-assing a bunch of things instead of whole-assing yeah, one thing do you and have that yeah same? you know it's funny when I uh, when I covered the Phillies um the manager was Charlie Manuel who uh, is, uh, I think, one of the more influential people I've had in my professional life. He was, you know, f- he is not the most book smart human being you're ever going to meet. I mean, he's just South Virginia country boy who spent his whole life in baseball. 
but he's one of those guys that you know, like this sort of like Forrest Gump level of like understand, like deep understanding of how the world works. And so he would just say things and you'd be like, yeah, that's right. I needed to be thinking about it that way. And, uh, he always used to just, every time you'd ask like some convoluted complex question about whatever, he'd always just sit back and he'd go, tell you what, watch the game. (laughs) And he's a (laughs) hundred percent right, man. You just, you learn so much more by watching the game. And yet like in this day and age, there's a million other things that are taking your attention, you know, pull, pulling you in one direction or another. What, let me look up the box scores. What's the stats? What's this drive chart look like? Who's saying what on Twitter? And you know, what are they saying on the TV feed? And uh, you know, all of this other stuff. The thing of it is turn the sound off everywhere. Just sit there and watch the game and you'd be amazed at how much you learn from it. And, and look, I'm as guilty as anybody about getting distracted i do it all the time um but there are times where you got to just sit back and say like what why don't i watch what i'm supposed to be writing about i mean do you have on your phone do you have notifications that go off whenever you get a uh, somebody tweets at you i I have turned off every this is this is a good piece of advice is that i somebody told me just turn off every notification on your phone i have um my phone will beep at me if certain people email me where I think it might be important or if certain people text me. Every, I'm Larry like Williams. Of, uh, yeah, <laughs> yes. The Larry Williams, <laughs> I get a special alert for that one. Uh, my, my phone just catches on fire, actually. Um, but, yeah, like I, I'm on a text chain with a bunch of my buddies from uh, high school, and it's – incessant and awful and i was like i gotta i gotta silence that and then i was like oh man my life's so much better after i silenced that and i was like silencing everything now <laughs> so all right your job it's not like you're covering at one team a beat where you have this structure and and during a season you you have a general idea of where you're going to be each day what you're going to be working on so how do you how hard is that <laughs> It's hard. I will say it. Uh, it's not even hard. In some ways, it's almost easier. Um, this is you and I have talked about. You know, when you when you're doing the same thing over and over again, um, it becomes very repetitive, and it, it starts feeling like, oh man, I've done this a million times before. But um, but it is structured at least. Uh, it, I had to learn how to work without that structure. And coming from a, a, you know, I'd always been a beat writer. That's all I'd ever done. So the idea that like I was supposed to figure out something to write about and nobody was telling me what to do, it's a good thing and a bad thing. I mean, it's a double-edged sword in, in so many respects. And so it, it's taken me, I still struggle with it from time to time. Like I, where's the, where's the line? Like, what am I, is, am I, Am I infringing on somebody else's territory? Am I writing a dumb story that nobody's going to be interested in? You know, I, I say all the time, I mean, I, I, I like to think of myself as being very informed, but I'm, never, I'm not going to say something about, um, you know, Duke football, that a Duke football fan, both of them, uh, don't already know for the most part. I mean, most fans probably know their teams better than I do because I can't watch 130 FBS teams and know enough about all of them. I can't watch uh, 14 ACC teams and know enough about all of them. So it's more a matter of what I've kind of realized is, like, you've got to figure, like, what do I care about this week? What am I writing a story on? And know that material better than anybody. And so it's sort of like, you know, the, the beauty is the world is your oyster. You can attack any story you want to attack. But the downside is there's so much to choose from that you've got to learn to, like, phase out all the other noise and focus in on something. And so um, that's been a balancing act, and it's especially hard, like, if I'm out here at a, a press conference with you all and, and you know, there's some news about um, – you know, a, say Amari Rogers gets hurt or whatever, uh, chances are ESPN on a national level doesn't care about that story. The beat writer inside of me is like, huge news, i got to yeah. write this. ESPN's going to be like, nah, it's, it's cool. Somebody else will take care of it. You know, I've got to – it takes a long time to kind of change that, that mindset, and it's still a thing I struggle with. So do you have like a whiteboard? Do you have a notebook where you <laughs> – like a process by which you – formulate your ideas or whittle them down or or whatever (laughs) no i wish i could say it was that complex it's you know i'm just like you know what i'm interested in like this is what it's come down to it's like i'm 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 interested in this story let me let me see if i can find something about it so um like i i just i wrote a story for last week before the the clemson syracuse game on dino babers and 
you know, it's I have been wanting to write about Dino because he's such an interesting person, and I've been run, wanting to write that story for two years now, but there hadn't been a really good opportunity. Well, now they're four and zero, and they're about to go play a team that they beat last year that is on a national stage. Now I have a hook that I can pitch to my editors and say, like, this is a story that you want now, and so it's just sort of one of those things that have been in the back of my mind for a long time, and I finally had the right opportunity to do it. Um, some of it is just like uh, I wrote a story over the summer on. Um, turnovers and why coaches are obsessed with turnovers when analytics folks would largely suggest turnovers are a matter of luck. So, you know, you think about what's the scarcest resource that, that coaches have, and it's time with their players. So if you're wasting a bunch of time on a practice field practicing to get takeaways when 90% of getting takeaways is about luck, it seems like an inefficient use of, of your scarcest resource. And I had had a conversation with Dave Clawson at Wake Forest, effectively have that conversation like three years ago, and he was like, no, nah, you're wrong about this. And mm -hmm. he brings me into their team meeting room where they've got all this signage up everywhere talking about like how important the football is and getting takeaways and not turning the ball over. And he's like, I preach it every day. Day and you look at the results. We're getting more takeaways. We're turning the ball over less. I mean, he it neglects to include the fact that their talent got a whole hell of a lot better during <laughs> that span, too. But, you know, it was just in the back of my mind that there is an inherent uh, difference between what numbers suggest and what coaches think about this topic. And it had just been in the back of my mind for a couple of years probably and then Miami had the turnover chain last year that became this huge thing and I was looking for an off-season project to work on and I said oh this thing I've been thinking about for forever the timing's right for this now let me go do it so you know it's it's just about like uh this is sort of another thing I learned covering baseball we here's what here's how a baseball beat be writer does their day, daily job is they show up at the ballpark for like a seven o'clock first pitch you show up at the ballpark at like 2 30 in the afternoon and then the locker room opens up at like three or three thirty. and you go into the locker room and then you stand there and wait because all the players are hiding out in the training room or whatever because they don't want to talk to us so you're just standing around a locker room watching a bunch of guys get dressed eat some sunflower seeds it's utterly boring and for the first year that i was on the job thought my god what a waste of time um and you're doing this for hours every day hours and then i started realizing like all the stuff that i'm seeing while i'm just standing around waiting in the locker room doing nothing still information that i'm getting i'm starting to learn who these players are who they talk to on their cell phones how they interact with each other what kind of food they like eating you know what kind of clothes they wore there that day and you start to learn something about these people and by the second year that i was doing it i started realizing like i've got all these details and color for stories that i want to write now that i just have because i was standing around watching it and i didn't think it was mattered at the time but now it's useful to me and i've really come to realize that that's how a lot of stories end up getting written is like oh that's noteworthy forget about it for two years oh you know yeah. what that's a good story and so that's sort of just how i've kind of approached it that was a long answer that that that's i probably okay. didn't it's need great. to give you you had a really good story i guess about a month ago on trevor lawrence's freshman year in high school how he had to beat out what's his name mitchell forrest morris or morris Wait, no. Miller. Miller, Miller Forrestall. Miller yeah. Forrestall, who is now a tight end at Alabama. Yeah. Can you just give some insight into how you stumbled onto that? And, yeah, and so um, I was working on a story actually for over the summer on Trevor Lawrence and Justin Fields, who were the number one and number two recruits in the country, both going to playoff teams, both with returning quarterbacks, both expecting, I'm sure, to play. Uh, and sort of in the wake of the Tua Tagovailoa national championship game thing, what does that mean for – you know, quarterback battles, even on good teams, uh, which proved to be a very prescient story angle, as it turns out. But uh, anyway, in doing my reporting for that, I, you know, I talked to um, Trevor's coach in high school, and I talked to his parents, and all of them said, oh, yeah, you know, there was this uh, quarterback, a veteran quarterback when Trevor got here, and, you know, they battled for a little while, and then, you know, Trevor won. And then I was like, well, what, you know, what, and what about that kid? And, oh, yeah, he moved to tight end. Oh, they're still super close friends. Oh, he plays at Alabama now. <laughs> and I'm like, wow, well, that's a pretty good story. <laughs> so it's just, you know, it's one of those things that I tell people this all the time. Like, you got to just ask questions, man, and, and ask follow-up questions, too, because you'd be amazed what you in, immediately know is a great story or a great detail that the person who's giving you that detail or that information has no idea that's something that would really help you out a lot. I'm sure you're asked every so often by young people, college kids, whatever, hey, I, I want to get into sports writing. What, what do you tell them? 
don't, uh, <laughs> uh, which that's not entirely a joke. I mean, I, 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 every time I get asked, the first thing I say is, um, consider whether or not this is really what you want. And I always say, if you picture your future and if you can picture any future besides this one, do that because, uh, I don't mean to be a pessimist, but as you well know, this is, this is a tough industry. Not that our jobs are that hard. They're, I mean, sometimes are most of the times pretty fun, but there's a lot of people who would love to have a fun job. There's a lot of people who are willing to do it pretty cheap. There's a lot of companies that are laying people off. Um, you know, God bless the athletic for creating the number of jobs that they have in the marketplace. And I hope that continues, but you know, we both know a lot of very talented, talented people in this business who are out of, out of work. Um, and so I just, you know, I don't, it's, it's, the job is not what people think it is most of the time. And so the first thing I do is try to enlighten people as to what the realities of doing this job are. And you'd be surprised how many people I'd never hear from again, not even a thank you for your time. <laughs> um, but after that, you know, the advice I always say is, is really two, twofold. I say, read a lot. And don't just read sports, because if all you're doing is reading sports stories, you're not learning to become a very good writer or reporter. Um, I think you have to read all the time. And when you read, don't just say, did I like that story or did I not? Say, why did I like this story or why didn't I? Why might the writer have done it the way that they did? How did they get this information? Like, deconstruct the hell out of a story that you like and figure out how it got to that point. Um, that's the stuff when I say I learned a lot about journalism when I was teaching. That's what I was doing. That's what made me better. Uh, and then the other thing is just write a lot. Um, and I heard a great story. Um, I'm, my, my, my friend Tommy Tomlinson was telling me this story uh, about Joe Posnanski, who is one of my all-time favorite writers. And Tommy and Joe uh, used to work together at the Charlotte Observer back in the day. Uh, and Joe had wanted to be a columnist. All he wanted was to be a columnist. Uh, and he eventually got hired at the Augusta paper to be a columnist there. And after he left, uh, Tommy was telling me that they found on Joe's old computer at the Charlotte Observer, they worked at like one of the satellite offices, which I don't even think most newspapers even have anymore. But uh, they found on Joe's computer that he had been writing a practice column every day wow. over whatever the news of the day was. He wrote a column that was never going to be published just to practice becoming a good columnist. And I can't imagine doing that. But then you read some of Joe's columns and you think, yeah, I get it. That's, I mean, it just, it, it takes a ton of practice and refinement and it can't just be about like, let me do it today. Let me get through today. You know, you've got to be thinking bigger picture and further along and trying to get better. And, um, you know, and then, you know, the, the other thing is like, man, I, I like it when people ask about my job. I, I'm sure you probably do too. Like, I, always, I think, you know, I think back to when I was a kid and I wanted to do this and I thought it was utterly unattainable and I wouldn't have even considered ever like reaching out to an actual sports writer and being like, Hey, I'm going to be like you. How do I do it? Like I was terrified of them. But uh, now that I am that guy that people ask, I'm like, this is cool. Yeah. I want to talk about this. And, uh, you know, I've, I've been very lucky to get to meet a lot of guys I looked up to. I got to meet Gary Smith, who was a brilliant writer for, for Sports Illustrated for years. I got to meet him when I was covering the Phillies. And, I mean, I've met a lot of famous people in my career, and I don't think any of them I cared about nearly as much as meeting Gary Smith. And, you know, he, I, I've heard the stories about how Gary wouldn't sit down to write a story until he'd talked to at least 50 sources. <laughs> like, just insane stuff like that. But, like, you get some great advice and insight. And, uh, you know, I was, even when I was early on in this business, I was scared to talk to the other guys who'd been on the beat for forever. I wanted to like show them that I belonged there too, or not that I was needed that needed their advice, but I needed their advice. I did. And so I, you know, I, I wish I could go back now and ask more questions and ask for more advice and look for more mentors than I did. I learned way too many lessons the hard way. So that's really the other thing that I would say is, man, like it's cool. Like I want to see people succeed in this business. I don't, you know, there's on an individual story, somebody might be competition, but in the big picture, man, I just want to see good reporters out there doing good work. Back to the Twitter <laughs> verse for a minute. What did you say to get Virginia to fan, to Virginia Tech fans so riled up? Was that last? Was that a year ago? This is literally the dumbest thing that has ever happened to me on Twitter, and that is saying something. So, like, it was before last season. I tweeted out some stats, like you know, the top five rushing defenses or something like that, and I abbreviated Virginia Tech Va Tech. Apparently, this is like saying Clemsoning. I, apparently, this is like a thing. And so I had like a dozen people like 
critique me. And first of all, I was like, I'm sure I've done this before. Why is it an issue now? And then I was like, this is a really stupid hill to die on. But then I was like, I appreciate stupidity. And like, if you're going to like, I was like, I'm going to spite the hell out of these people. So that's the other thing. I, you know, I want, I want to be people's pals on Twitter, but if you kind of cross me in the wrong direction over something too stupid, I will, I will spite the hell out of you. So I just started using Vatek exclusively <laughs> and then like looking for examples of where other people had used. So like finding like uh, a, a screen grab from a game from like 1987 where CBS had abbreviated it Vatek. And I'm like, see, um, but anyway, so they played West Virginia in the opener last year. And so I made a general bet with Twitter that if Virginia tech won, I would not refer to them as Vatek anymore. And if they lost, I could only refer to them as Vatek for the, for the <laughs> remainder of my time. Uh, and they won. So I don't use it anymore, I suppose, except for this podcast, which I'm going to assume most of your listeners are not Vatek fans. David, you have transcribing to do, and unfortunately, <laughs> no, let's this, do another three, four hours of this. Unfortunately, this can't last till midnight uh, tonight. But man, thank you for uh, being so generous with your time, and, and it's been a blast having you around Clemson over the years. And and uh, I thought I was going to get to ask you some questions. What? Uh, have at it, I guess. No, I Maybe. Got no, I got nothing. Of course, of course I can edit. I can always uh, edit edit, <laughs> edit the questions out but uh is there anything we haven't talked about that maybe i should have brought up i don't know um nothing that probably wouldn't get me fired if we <laughs> talked about it so we, we'll wrap it up a lickety split then on, on that on that count so thank you again david thanks and, for having uh, me appreciate it all right that was so much fun really cool of david to to sit down with us and give such a big window into his experiences and his thoughts and and his history. So thanks to David for sharing his time. Thanks to our title sponsor, Parham Smith, an arch and hold law firm in Greenville. Also, the Abernathy Boutique Hotel. Smack dab in Clemson. A couple of blocks from the stadium. Also, thanks to Tandem Payment in Greenville. And most of all, thanks to all of you for making this a twice-weekly part of your routine everybody have a safe weekend and next podcast scheduled to drop monday morning take care